So today's Easter. What's your favorite part about Easter? You think? Or we won't say candy and eggs. Yesterday, um, we 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 tend to do the family Easter stuff at, at home on on Saturday because um, Sundays in our house are crazy. And so so last night, Susanna said, "Tomorrow is church Easter." So I was very excited about church. So what's your favorite part about church Easter? Do you have one? Do you have a memory? I like singing. You like singing? Yes. Cool. You guys did a good job singing. I like the lilies. One of the um, things, if you go to some different kind of style churches, they um, have the understanding that, that church and worship is a multi-sensory kind of thing. That it's not just... Um, you know, in, in this Calvinist tradition, we're very plain. We, we, we like things plain and, and everything. Um, but in like a Greek Orthodox church, they have icons and pictures on the wall of saints and of different things. And they have usually have a tomb connected to their um, sanctuary. So you can go in there and experience total darkness like it would be inside a tomb. Um, and they have incense um, always, which is a smelling kind of thing. So with, uh, in addition to the songs and the story and the sermon and all of the icons and all that kind of stuff, you get a sense of, of the smell too. And so we get that on Easter. These lilies are really smelling good, good smell. When I came in here, it whacked me in the face this morning. But then um, at about 8.45, the light was perfectly shined from the, those um, windows. To come at an angle, and that's the picture that was on the opening of the online um, version of, of, of worship. So that's really pretty. So I, I like the lilies. They always are, even though they kind of sometimes make me tear up and and sneeze and stuff. They are really pretty. I like the music too. The chessboard. Oh, not unlike the chessboard in my office, it also makes me sneeze. Yeah. Do you all have any other favorite parts? I like the Easter egg. Easter egg hunts afterwards, which I wanted to say, I forgot to announce that at the beginning, I was gonna announce it at the end, is that the Easter egg hunt will be outside for all of the adults, for the kids, um, you guys, at right after church, as soon as church is over, all right? So all of these things are given to help us to celebrate something that doesn't just matter to us on Easter Sunday, but it matters to us in our entire lives, which is the idea that Christ was, erect, was resurrected. That the different limits that we thought were placed on life, like death and whatever, don't necessarily apply in God's world. That God has the power through love, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, to bring us into a different kind of world. And that's what Easter is about. So let's pray and give thanks. Dear God, thank you so much for Easter. Thank you for giving your son um, to, to show us the boundlessness of your love, the boundlessness of your power, that it busts through any limitations that we would think um, exist. Help us to see and live into that in every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think Miss Deanna has an activity downstairs if anybody wants to go. Uh, the top. Can you go with them? <laughs> Almighty God, on this Easter Sunday, we ask for you to send your Holy Spirit that as the word is read and proclaimed, that it may be the word that we need to hear on this Easter Sunday, that, that the Holy Spirit can be given to us to illuminate the words and that the meditations um, of our hearts will be in line with, with you. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. So on this Easter Sunday, I think it's always good to begin uh, this part of the worship service, the sermon part of the worship service, with the story itself. And in any time that we look at a biblical story that we are really familiar with, like this one, this is one that we hear, there are four different versions of it, and we hear one of them at least every year um, on Easter. Um, there are movies that show this story. There are, there are so many countless ways that we come to experience the story of the resurrection. Um, so I invite you, as we hear it read, to listen for something that you may not have heard before. You know, you know the general, so listen to the detail and see if there's any detail that jumps off the, out of my mouth, I guess, but jumps off the page um, anew this morning. This is Luke's version, uh, Luke 24, 1 through 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all of these things to the eleven and to all of the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Is this the word of the Lord? Thanks be to God. Their words seemed to them to be nonsense, literally no sense, has no place. What are you talking about? Have you lost your mind? Even, even Peter, having gone, run to the tomb in disbelief, sees the body gone, sees the strips of linen, and walks away wondering to himself what had happened. The two men there in the lightning white um, outfits tell them you've heard this before remember Jesus said he needed to be turned over to sinners he needed to be crucified so that he could raise again from the dead you've heard this Peter who's been as close to him as anybody else walks away from the tomb wondering what has happened hears the story and thinks of it as nonsense From here, in Luke's Gospel, you have a series of stories of revelation. Um, the most famous one is the Emmaus Road story, where Jesus breaks bread before them, and their eyes are open, and they see, finally, oh, Jesus, not so much nonsense after all. There's another story less known, than they're less, less often read than the, the Emmaus story, is the broiled fish. They eat some broiled fish, and then their eyes are opened. Jesus opens their minds, opens their eyes, and then allows them to see. They went away wondering, but then their hearts and minds are open, and they believe. We know this story well, and we know God well, right? Been learning about God since we are little children. We've been in church, most of us, a lot, off and on throughout our lives. Easter, 
Christmas, other times, we're here, we understand the story of God, we know who God is, right? We can turn on the TV and it wouldn't take very long for us to hear something about God. Positive, negative, do you believe, do they believe, does he believe, how come he doesn't believe, how can you believe? God's everywhere. At least in our knowledge, our, our faulty knowledge of God. This Lent, though, what we've tried to do throughout the, the time, those of us that have been working on this, we try to erase that knowledge to some extent, the best that we can, to get back to the blank, blank slate. And instead of just altering what we already know, to start fresh and lay it on from the beginning. What are the things that God is? Who is God? It's been quite a journey. We opened up the Bible and we thought about the Bible as if it were kind of a, a work of literature in some sense. And we looked at what does the character God do? What does God say? And what do people throughout time say about God? at least giving us three different areas, three different vantage points to look at who God is. It's a different way of looking at the biblical testament. It was interesting, as I was sharing the daily devotions on Facebook and other places, it was amazing how often, and it was kind of difficult at the beginning, how often people commenting on the, on the post wanted to jump to 316, right? Who is God? What does God do? Jesus is God. Jesus was raised. 316, I know, gives me eternal life. I know God because of Jesus. And I said, well, wait a second. Hold off. Hold off. Yes, certainly. And today we come to manifest that part of the story. And, and it does define everything that we come to know about God. Because everything that we could have come to know about God without that would have been just a little bit short of reality. Now we come to today. Is it possible for us to know God outside of the resurrection, right? Is the, is the journey that we've been on even possible? Is it worthwhile? Is it possible to know God outside of the re resurrection? Because the resurrection shapes God for us. It shapes everything that we know about God. The trouble is, though, is what we come to know easily the things that we come to know the most easiest, like John 3.16. Often we take for granted. We don't see the full picture because it's just second hand to us. It's second nature for us to think about, yeah, Easter. A little easy at all. It's like the poem that I shared a couple of weeks ago, Where is God? Oh, where is the sea, the fishes cried as they swam the crystal clearness through. We hit, we've heard from old, of old of the ocean's tide, and we long to look on the waters blue. The wise ones speak of the infinite sea. Oh, who can tell us if such there be? It's an interesting question. Can the fish see the water that they swim in? Because it's all that they know. The other one, the lark flew up in the morning bright and sang and bounced on sunny wings, and this was its song. I see the light, I look over a world of beautiful things, but flying and singing everywhere, in vain I have searched to find the air. He leaves the God verses out and lets you make them up for yourself. But this is very much a poem about God. We are immersed in God's world. God is everywhere. Do we ever take time to see what God is around us? <clears throat> I want to today 
before, what we, before we go to look at what God is because of the resurrection, I want to take a minute to think about God minus the resurrection. When I was in Gordonsville one Sunday, I preached a sermon based on what would the world be if there was no resurrection. It was Easter morning, and instead of reading the scripture the way it was, I altered it a little bit. Like such, Mary came to the tomb. She was worried about how she would roll the rock away. Sound familiar? She had come to anoint the body. She showed up about 6.30. There was only one guard there. She said, hey, I've come to anoint this body. Could you help me roll this stone away? He said, there's no way that I can do it by myself and you, the two of us. You have to wait till about 9 o'clock when the rest of the centurions come by. They're going to come for the day shift. Instead of one here, there's like 10 of us. Maybe the 12 of us can grab it together and maybe we can move the stone a little bit, right? They finally get that done about 1130. She's tired already from the day that she is. She takes the fresh anoints. She anoints the body. They close the tomb up. She goes about her life the way that it was before. The disciples, they return to fishing or tax collecting or other zealotry, rebellion, and whatnot. This is the story the way that it should have been. It's much like the destruction of the temple, really, right? We think of Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept, when the, we remembered Zion, there on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked for songs. They asked us to sing songs. Our tormentors demanded that we sing songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. They said, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while we are exiled to a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. You can imagine this disciple sitting around all those years hence, telling the stories of the glorious time that they spent when they were with Jesus. If that were the case, they may have lived longer lives here on earth. Instead, they were called to share a mission, some of them crucified, some of them stoned. Who is God if the temple can be destroyed? That is what the Jews were all saying when they were in Babylon. If you read Isaiah, and you read Jeremiah, and you read Ezekiel, and you read the great prophets of the exile, you will see that question is central to everything that they write about. Who is God if the temple is destroyed? They come to the fact and the understanding that God is the one who destroyed the temple himself. That God is like unlike any other God that has ever been, right? When a Greek city was destroyed and the royal protector out front was a statue and temple of Apollo, and Apollo got destroyed, Apollo lost. Apollo was not as strong as Marduk or whoever was the patron of the other tribe. Every time the Egyptians lost, Osiris took a beating. But here, the God of the Israelites, the God of Moses, does not, is not destroyed. Who is God if Christ is crucified, crucified but not raised? Again, the temple was destroyed. Why would God allow himself to be killed? Well, you know, we could tell stories about him doing it on purpose, but it's a long way to go mentally. 
It is most likely that a God who would do that, a God who would allow that, a God who had that happen, would be one of three things. An angry God, an apathetic God, or a broken-hearted God. An angry God says, well, punish them. They deserve it. They're sinners. They've angered me since the beginning. I've been trying and trying to deal with these people. I send them my son, and what do they do? They crucify him. Forget them. I don't need those people. An apathetic God says, well, I created the world, and I gave them everything I thought to give them. <laughs> They're on their own. I don't care. I gave it. Y'all deal with it the way you want. The brokenhearted God is a little bit more close to home, right? We think, well, I love those people. I love them. I, I care so much about them. I cry for them. I weep for them. Please, Jerusalem, at some point, when are you going to get this straight? I wish that I could do something to fix this situation, but my heart breaks and I am powerless to do a thing about it. The God who created the entire world is absolutely powerless to do anything about these people on earth who don't know him, don't care about him, and crucify him when he comes around. And he sits up there in heaven, brokenhearted and futile and ineffectual, wondering, man, I wish they would just love me. An angry God, an apathetic God, or a brokenhearted God. That is not what we get in the Easter God. Look at Acts 3, 11 through 21. <clears throat> While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solon, uh, Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our, our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disown the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this by faith in the name of Jesus. This man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that this, his Messiah, would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, this Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophet. This, too, is the word of the Lord and the testament of the disciples. The Easter God is a God of possibility, a God of power, a God of love, and a God of potential. Why does this surprise you, the disciples say? Lest they forgot the Luke encounter, when all of them were surprised too, and they thought all of this was nonsense. Take some time 
for our minds to lose the power and the grip that an angry God, an apathetic God, and a broken-hearted God have over our mindset. There is, there is a little glimmer of that God that we hold on to all the time. Those three. We hold on to them all the time. And, we, and it is hard for us to allow the Easter God to permeate through the rest of our lives. The other gods, those three, are easy to put into a box. They're easy to fit into the lifestyle that we would have. They're easy to be an added essential. You can fit it in your handbag. But when you're faced with something real, and you go to pull it out, it's either angry and telling, well, you deserve this, or it's apathetic and says, I don't care what happens to you. Or it's broken hearted. And says, I'm sorry that you're going through this, but I just can't do anything about it. I wish I could. The Easter God is different. The Easter God does not leave you abandoned. The Easter God envelops you and envelops everything around you and is everything that is around you. Everything that you around you that is around you is filled with the power, the love, and the potential of the Easter God. It's not the Easter God that these Israelites are serving that the disciples come to and perform this miracle. And it wasn't the Easter God yet that the disciples were serving when they came to the empty tomb or they heard the message from the women and they said it was nonsense. It wasn't there yet. They were still wandering and wondering. They were still fearing. Remember that from the Easter story too. Be not afraid. Why do you come here afraid? Why are you amazed? They're still taking things into their own hands. If love on the other, other side is never holding tight but letting go, they're not doing that yet. It's like that one of the Celtic woman songs that I love. Love must never hold, never hold, never hold tight but let go. An Easter love and an Easter God shows us that because of his power, because of his love, and because of his connection, we can let go of our grip. Jesus says in John's gospel that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Part of that way is letting go and loving because that's exactly what Jesus does. We know that today with the songs, the celebrations, the lilies, the white, the light, the hope, all of the singing. We know that on Easter Sunday. We're filled with that on Easter Sunday. We're filled with that when we meet together in the garden. We're filled with that today. We're filled with that later when we join around a table together with family and enjoy that time together. We understand it on Easter Sunday. We kind of get a glimpse of the Easter God. But how long does it last? Last week we asked the question, how do we make it last? How do we make the Palm Sunday celebration last? Because the Palm Sunday story is, is, is one where the celebration doesn't last. It turns from Hosanna to crucify him. We want the Easter story to last in our hearts. And the only way to do that is to realize that God is the Easter God. 
Last week, I had all of us singing like a frenzy. We were pretending that we were Sam Cooke and the Soul Stirrers, and I had this side saying, oom pop, oom pop, or something like that, and I had this side saying, who is God, who is God? And I was trying to sing, and I lost the tune because I was all caught up in the frenzy of it. But it doesn't matter because the tune was infectious and it got somewhere into some people along the way. But I don't care how good of a party you throw on Sunday, that's not what makes it last. Last week was kind of like, I don't know if you've ever seen the reduced Shakespeare company do the complete works of Shakespeare abridged. They do all the book, the big fat book in two hours, and it's impressive the way they do it. They're running, all there's three of them, they're running all over the place. It's a funny thing, I used to show it all the time when I was teaching. They get to the part where Ophelia screams and goes crazy and kills herself, right? She, she, she kills herself and it's a big, long Shakespearean thing, but they reduce it, remember it's about reducing and abridging it, they reduce it down to a scream. So they pull somebody out of the audience, a woman out of the audience, and they ask her to scream. And so she goes, ah! and they're like, that was totally pathetic. <laughs> and then one of the other ones says, well, what's missing here is context, right? We need to build this up. We need to, we need to workshop this. We need to have it work a little bit. And so they kind of do what we did last week with the people having parts. And some of the people were saying, maybe, maybe not, because she was washed in a flood of indecision. And they had other people saying, Harsh words to her, like, get thee to a nunnery. And there was all of this stuff going on. They had a man running back and forth across the stage because he represented her mind with a thousand ideas. So they got all of this going on at one time, and then it stops, and they point to her, and she goes, ah! It was awesome. <laughs> <coughs> It built to a moment, and that moment had come. She screamed, she felt it. Could she have recreated that an hour later for her friends? Easter has to teach us something different about God. It has to teach us something different about the world. And because if we are to know something different about God, it tells us something different about the world because the world is his. Each and every moment that you live in your life is his. All of them. Every single one. And you're thinking in your head, but that time, yes, that time too. That time that you were lost and searching and broken, and like, where is God? God was there. Absolutely God was there. That time where you're chilling with your buddies in college, and you're out on the fraternity deck, and you're drinking beers, and you're mocking the people at church as they leave because you're having a much better time than you are, guess where God is? With you and them. All of it. You are not separated ever from God's presence because everything in this world is made by God. All of it. So each and every moment made by an Easter God is filled with love, power, potential, grace. Each and every moment with a loving Easter God is about an embrace of grace. It rhymes so that you can remember it. An embrace of grace. Both he embracing you with grace and you're embracing what grace means, which is the ups and the downs of life are all connected to grace. Grace, she died 30 years ago. No, grace. The blessing of life. The blessings of life are all connected in every single moment. They are something, every single moment that you live is a time where God is pulling you closer to him, pulling you closer in an embrace, 
No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, God is pulling you closer, and you can't really resist it. You can try, but you can't really resist it. He's pulling you closer. He's embracing you, waiting for you to embrace the grace that he's giving to you. There is no limit, and the cup overflows. And since it's overflowing, every moment also gives us a chance to extend that grace outward from ourselves to each other, to other people. This is what we call love. <clears throat> Pulls us closer and allows us to overflow into each other. There is no limit, it is overflowing. Day by day, and with each passing moment. Moment, remember, no limitations. Love, grace, extend the grace. Strength I find to meet my, my trials. Where? Here. Not just when we die, but now. Absolutely now. In every moment that we are alive here, but because it's every moment, also every moment that we are dead and passed on into heaven. Both. Strength I find to meet my trials here, trusting in my Father's wise bestowment. There is no cause for worry or for fear. It's as if that's a song. It's beautiful. It's my favorite hymn. Day by day, and with each passing moment, because each passing moment is a new opportunity. That is what the Easter God teaches us. Leave behind the other three idols. They don't exist. They are mere fragments of what the amazing wonder of the Easter God is. They are the things that all of the ancient people were searching for and just couldn't quite find in everything that they followed. It is fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, give us strength for our trials here. Give us faith in the resurrection. Give us faith in the limitlessness, limitlessness of your power. Give us faith enough to embrace the grace that you offer. Faith enough to have it overflow through us that we might extend it. Extend it, not sell it. Extend it, not gift it. Extend it, but let it flow over and out from inside. Freely offer as you do. Help our lives to be informed by the Jesus God, the Easter God, in every moment possible, because that is the God that is. That is the God who creates every moment. Be with those that we've mentioned earlier that were suffering from sickness or, or disease, fighting battles for their lives. Be with them. Let them know that that battle for their life is already won. Because it goes on. Be with those who are suffering and mourning loss. Loss of loved ones. Fill them with the hope and potential of your power and grace and love that that story is not over either. Be with our world as we are divided, as people are grabbing and the grabbing hands are grabbing all that they can, pushing and pulling. Help us all to learn a little bit about love 
and to let go. Let go trusting that our neighbor is also going to let go and that God, you will change hearts to bring us all to you. Help us, help us to step into the fulfillment of your promise for we know that it lasts forever. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, to who the world whom we testify has risen, and pray in the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Our closing hymn is a song very much about the Easter God. It is Because He Lives. And we sing it together. <laughs>